Hi everyone, I'm, uh, I'm going to get started here. I'm Rachel Ross, I'm the AmeriCorps member at the Clean Water Initiative Program. Um, and we're, we apologize for the late notice and the topic change, um, but we're glad that you're all here and could join us either in the room or online. Um, we will be covering the phosphorus controls for municipal stormwater and state highways uh, topic at a different time um, to be determined. And um, we have a couple presenters here from DEC. Rich Langdon, who is the supervising aquatic biologist in the biomonitoring program, and Eric Davis, who's a river ecologist with the rivers program. Um, and Bethany Sargent will be fielding questions um, for the Skype viewers online. Um, so, just yeah, so if I could just say for folks who are participating via Skype for Business, if you could just type in your question via the messaging um, through that program, and I'll field them in the room. And it's fine just if folks either in the room or online want to ask questions as um, Rich and Eric present. Great. I'll turn it over to Rich. OK. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming today and those um, who are Skyping in. Um, I'm going to be reviewing today <clears throat> some of the, um, all of the significant changes that have gone, have taken place within the, uh, that are included in the two, 2016 version of the water quality standards. Um, there were many changes made. Uh, we're particularly excited about this group of changes that were made um, in, in this version. Um, I'm, we believe, the, the, the folks, and there was a lot of people involved in this, we all believe that um, the current version uh, permits the agency um, significant, <clears throat> uh, a significant uh, ability to increase the protection of our surface waters through reclassification. And a couple <coughs> of um, legislative acts actually uh, paved the way for that. Um, in 2012, the Vermont Legislature passed Act 138, which um, transferred the authority to reclassify um, waters from the state from the Natural Resources Board to the Agency of Natural Resources, um, which essentially eliminated a whole level of review. Um, there was quite a bit of redundancy involved in that, and um, that, that was a, a fairly significant step. Um, in 2016, um, before we had, uh, the agency had an opportunity to change, to make the significant changes in the water quality standards that were made, we had to uh, put forth uh, a legislative act to be signed by the governor that would uh, permit us to um, establish a new class of waters, B2, or B1 rather, and to uh, ind independently uh, classify water by its by the various uses. Uh, these are major changes, and we needed to enact uh, changes in the statute 1253, um, so we could in turn make the changes in the water quality standards, which is a rule. Okay, a um, <clears throat> little bit of review. Um, state water quality standards are essentially a translation of the Clean Water Act. Uh, directives. Um, there are three basic elements in every set, every state set of water quality standards. Uh, water quality classification, uh, such as A and B, um, and the designated uses um, for those particular classifications. And we presently have eight. This is, these are just um, examples. Um, associated criteria, the second element, um, the criteria are developed both narrative and quantitative or numeric that support each one of these designated uses uh, per, per class. And finally, an anti-degradation policy. Okay, to review the um, water quality standards uh, designated uses are as follows. Aquatic biota and wildlife, aquatic habitat, uh, the three recreational uses, swimming, boating, and fishing, um, aesthetic conditions, public water source, and irrigation for crops. I'm not going to talk too much about irrigation. Uh, we only have one particular class for that, and that's the lowest class, class B2. 
Um, it's important to note that um, all designated uses are expected to be met in all waters of the state at at least Class B2 level. Um, when you hear of a violation of a water quality standard, um, it has to relate to one of these uses, even um, parameters such as uh, flow measurements, um, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, uh, pH, and so forth. Okay, um, what was unique about this review process, that, which began about a year and a half ago, was that at the staff level, normally um, water quality standards review are undertaken by uh, legal staff and management, and um, certain um, line staff, if you will, um, have had opportunity here and there to, to have to provide their input. Uh, but this time the whole process began at the staff level. We had about a year and a half of meetings in this very room um, between river biologists, lake biologists, permit writers of all sorts, and uh, a couple of uh, jokers from the Rivers Program. One is here today. Uh, we had some great talks. Uh, it was very interesting for all of us to um, uh, learn the other's perspective of how they use the water quality standards. And um, we would come in with ideas of how we would like to see it, say, from a biological perspective. And then I talked to the Rivers guys, Eric being one of them, and they say, no, 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 we can't split it that way. We have to put it this way. So eventually we worked it out, um, put forth um, a working draft, and moved it on up to management and um, to legal, and they changed a few things. Um, it, it's also, it was also interesting to note to, to be at the intersection of law and science. Um, the two are almost like oil and water, but they have to be mixed <laughs> because that's what our job is. Um, they're two very different uh, per perspectives. And the process of developing a product that includes both is pretty challenging. It's also kind of interesting. I'll go backwards here. OK, I'm um, just going to outline the seven significant changes that were enacted in, in the 2016 version. Uh, the big one was that instead of expecting all uses to be at the same level for a particular class of water, we will take a water and classify one or more uses independently. So you could have a water classified as A1 for aquatic biota and B2 for everything else. I'll get into this a little, a little later. The other big change was the introduction of a new class of waters, which is intermediate between our, our bottom level B2 and our top level A1. Included in this version was an agreement with Green Mountain National Forest. We had several meetings with, with them, which ended up uh, with a reclassification of those streams from primarily they were B2 to an A1 condition. Um, these streams are all in um, remote areas. They're uh, wilderness areas. Uh, 95 to 100 percent of the coverage of the drainage is forested. It's highly likely that the aquatic biota and other aspects are all meeting A1 standards there. Um, some of the minor changes we made, and there were many, um, we actually split the habitat of aquatic biota uses up into individual uses, as you just saw in the last slide. slide. They were combined um, previously, um, which made it kind of difficult to apply criteria because it was kind of not exactly, exactly apples and oranges, but you had a set of habitat criteria which were specific to the physical um, uh, environment of streams, rivers, and lakes. And then you had a set along with that of biological uh, parameters, and they don't always link up. So in an effort to uh, equally um, put weight on both of them, we separated them out. And it, it, I, I think it's resulted in a lot clearer um, <coughs> format. And Rich, I have a question sure. online that's very specific. Um, from PAMS, what is the seasonal restriction for manure stockpiling on floodplains, and how will that relate to the anti-degradation policy? I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, yes, that would be a different um, a different group. And anti-degradation, I don't think covers that. 
but um, it would it would have to be yeah it, it would have to be an agricultural rule, and that is probably being discussed now in the required agricultural practices, okay. which are being developed. Okay, thanks, Rich. Okay, we uh, tweak the temperature criteria um, for cold water fisheries for fishing and fishing use um, for uh, <coughs> Class B1. <clears throat> Biological assessment procedures are now published in Appendix G of the Water Quality Standards. Um, these are essentially a boiled down version of our very lengthy uh, procedures that we've been following over the past few years. Um, these address uh, sampling methods and analytical methods. Um, manage, we now manage streams uh, specifically through stream alteration permits and hydro licensing, hydro licensing using the stream equilibrium, equilibrium standard, which Eric will get into uh, about mid-talk. And we updated some toxic criteria into Appendix C just to be consistent with the EPA listing. Um, we did a lot of clarification of language. Um, there was a lot of stuff in there that had remained in there that wasn't timely, um, that could have been reworded, and we did so. Um, the group uh, basically went through the water quality standards page by page by page. Okay, what was, what was the problem with the existing version? The existing version was developed in 2000. In itself, it was a pretty good effort to include um, uh, the uh, biological, the specific uh, numeric biological criteria. Um, it also took a stab at um, addressing the, the large uh, gap or the range of conditions that embodied class B waters. Uh, people felt that we needed more levels, that the range in class B from the very bottom to the very top was, was, was too high, uh, was, was uh, too excessive. Um, and then you went to class A1. Um, so water management typing attempted, attempted to slip a floor in there into class B without reclassification, without going through the reclassification process. This was called water management typing. Um, at the time, we had two levels of classes, A and B. A1 was uh, for uh, all uses except water, uh, water sources. Um, uh, the uh, drinking water source um, is uh, addressed in A2 only. That's the only cla uh, uh, classification um, that addresses uh, drinking water. A1 is for all the rest. B um, was for everything in A1 and A2. So for drinking water, we had A2 and we had B. Um, so that's about that. Typing. It split class B into two levels, um, B1 and B23. Now that looks like three levels, but essentially B23 was the same level of, of um, biological expect expectation. Um, B3 waters were uh, relevant to hydro licensing um, below the dams. Um, in those cases, uh, these waters were classified as B3, and uh, the aquatic biota uh, criteria would be assumed to be met based on habitat studies only. Um, uh, enough of that. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this too much because we killed it <laughs> in this version. Um, Okay, assuming that all uses um, needed to be the same, they, they basically um, assume that, okay, if we're going to reclassify water to B1 or A1, all eight uses are going to have to be at that level, and we're going to have to protect each and every one of those uses to the exact same level. Um, this was an issue because the protection of one use may lead to the degradation of another use, because each use had of uh, different endpoints and could be rated on different scales. The, uh, the final um, stake in the heart of this was that all waters in the state would be typed. Um, that required probably a 300% increase in personnel uh, in the state. Um, there's no way that, that we could have done that. 
Um, in the 15 years of its existence, uh, no waters were ever typed. Typing did not recognize that there were two scales, two basic scales um, involved in protecting the uses. The human use standard, which is the value of the use to us, uh, recreation, fishing, boating, and swimming, and water supply and irrigation. Um, those are all relative to our, to our needs. And then there are the, e the ecological uses, the ecological um, standard, which is the natural condition. Aquatic biota, aquatic habitat, and aesthetics are all rated based on their similarity to what we call in the natural condition. And the natural condition doesn't mean the pristine condition um, that was present 300 years ago. The natural condition is just the best we have. Um, it's depicted in uh, drainages with um, a minimum of human activity. Um, so it's the best we have. It's the least impact. And this is just an illustration of where class B1 fits in between A1 and, and B, B2 for those um, ecological endpoint uses. Um, Class A1 is excellent, Class B1 very, very good, and Class B2 is good. Fair and poor uh, don't meet anything, uh, any one of our uses, and um, if a water is designated as Class B2 um, performance um, below that particular level um, is uh, regarded as an impairment and a water quality violation. Okay. the. Uh, Changes in classes, um, I think they've been basically simplified. That was one of our aims. Uh, some things didn't change. The 2000 version had <coughs> uh, A1 and A2 streams. Uh, 2016 version remains exactly the same. So nothing has changed there. Um, our new class B1 was basically um, a holdover, holdover from the old water uh, management type B1. Um, so with, with aquatic biota, we simply took the uh, numeric and narrative standards that we used for uh, water quality management type B1 and shifted them over to the classification B1. Okay, and the confusing uh, class B cluster here, B2, three, B3, which were never actually enacted, uh, so we ended up with a class B. Um, they're all um, combined into our current class B2. So we end up with A1, A2, B1, and B2. Okay, our Act 79 recognized this, this fact that um, we can have high quality uses that are supported by different management approaches. Um, the guy on the left here is holding a largemouth bass uh, representing excellent uh, uh, fishery. The uh, middle photograph, good aesthetics, and you have a crazy boater going down uh, maybe the north branch of the Winooski um, in his kayak, which represents, whoops, represents uh, A1 uh, or B1 boating conditions. A um, couple of examples here, North Branch of the Winooski, uh, where I live. Um, class B1 uses uh, could very well be for boating and aesthetics. It's a beautiful stretch of river. Uh, kayakers um, definitely use the river during uh, spring high flows. Um, we sample the aquatic biota, and I've talked to anglers, and it's no great shakes in terms of B1 or A1. Um, aquatic habitat, drinking water supply, nothing to write home about. So um, potentially the North Branch of the Winooski could be rated B1 or even A1 for boating and aesthetics uh, and B2 for all the rest of the uses. Um, in contrast, the Middlebury River um, has shown excellent aquatic biota, or at least very good um, aquatic biota. Uh, the habitat that supports it, the fishing is supposedly very good. Um, but the boating and aesthetics uh, are basically so-so. So we have two examples there indicating how this uh, classification by independent uses might, might look. Um, I've got a couple of slides on the, um, how the criteria, the native cri or narrative criteria um, equate um, 
over the various classes. Um, all the uh, uses except irrigation are on the left, and the uh, classification is across the top. Aquatic biota habitat and aesthetics. Natural condition, very good, good. Um, it's as simple as that. We strove to make the management implications, which are in black, um, and uh, the uh, narrative uh, criteria um, as similar as we could to avoid confusion. Um, so we implemented these, these words, and you'll see them over and over again um, through this presentation and if you look through the water quality standards. Um, the, the natural condition um, is essentially the goal we're looking for. Um, if a particular site meets the criteria, which, is which would be naturally close to a natural condition, um, it can qualify for an individual <coughs> classification. Um, as you depart from that expectation or from that natural condition, you go into a minor change, into a moderate change, and lower and lower classifications. The um, human use standards, fishing, swimming, boating, public water source, um, have all different uh, sets of expectation. The fishing that's mentioned in our water quality standards now is for cold water uh, fisheries. The A1 designation is a salmonid population in its natural condition, uh, which means only brook trout or lake trout. Um, in a stream or a lake. Um, these are our native, our native um, uh, species to, to, to Vermont. Um, B2 and B1 waters um, essentially allow for rainbows and uh, brown trout as well. Um, and they, those um, levels more relate to uh, not just the presence of native brook trout, but they relate to um, levels or uh, densities of catchable size fish. Swimming uh, E. coli is the criteria and we go from excellent to good. There's no B1. Um, boating is excellent, very good, and good. Um, we, um, the, um, the wording to me is a little confusing. Maximum extent without degradation. Um, essentially what it means, I think, is that you maintain the conditions that support that level of boating um, without harming any other uses as well. Um, the hydrology uh, criteria are used for class B2, um, and that would come in the uh, form of flow reductions, uh, the amount of maximum allowed flow of modifications. A flow study essentially ensuring that all uses are supported. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, sir. And public water sources, I said, uh, for A2 and B2. Um, uniformly excellent, excellent character, um, highly suitable versus suitable. And again, E. coli is used as the, uh, as the criteria. Um, getting a little bit more into what the standards say, I just have a couple of slides on the specifics. Aquatic biota use, uh, water shall be managed to achieve and maintain excellent biological integrity and aquatic biota and wildlife consistent with waters in their natural condition. Um, this is A1. Uh, again, B1 and B2, very good and good. Uh, the criteria we have um, are basically uh, look at the um, amount of change that is allowed uh, to be placed into a particular class. Uh, natural condition, uh, B1, where we have very good Biological integrity is a minor change, and there's moderate changes allowed in um, class B2 waters. Um, we have specific numeric criteria that address each one of these um, uh, narrative sets here. And Rich, question online sure. relative to that. Um, question, can you provide some additional definition of what constitutes natural condition in the A1 category? Okay, um, that's a good question. Um, we use sites that are uh, minimally impacted by human activity. We, we go throughout the state looking for sites that are primarily forested, um, sites that don't have too many roads in the drainage, uh, too much building. 
Um, we do have areas where the biological integrity is excellent and there's a lot of activity going on. We try not to use them. But the, the first step in developing our criteria was to identify um, our best streams, streams that fit our concept of being um, the most uh, predictive or the most representative of an unimpaired condition. Uh, these are our best streams. Uh, and certainly we, we don't have any one reference condition or reference stream set because the um, natural condition varies from stream to stream in terms of their size, their elevation, and their geographic location within the state. Um, so we had to not only find a set of really good streams by which we could gauge others, we had to separate that set of reference streams or natural condition streams by natural stream, stream type. So we have several sets of criteria that we do use when we, um, when we assess a particular river or, or stream site. That answers the question. Okay, um, we also introduced the idea of lakes, uh, some uh, narrative criteria in lakes for A1, B1, and B2, and they are primarily uh, related to, at this point, to the uh, water level uh, restrictions um, and water uh, with withdrawal. So again, we have natural, minor, and moderate um, differences uh, from the natural uh, condition there. Ah, and here we come to stream equilibrium, a, a concept that was brought to us in Acts 110 and 138, and I will shift the discussion over to Eric Davis to explain a little bit more about this. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Rick. Martin, if we uh, switch. Oh, yep, yep. I can do that. Just um, step back to this aquatic habitat use table here for a moment and just um, kind of outline what has stayed the same and what has changed. Um, the management objectives have, have largely stayed the same. In the existing water quality standards, there's um, a directive to manage to a certain quality of aquatic habitat. Um, and in the criteria, there's a certain degree of departure um, that's permitted from reference condition or natural condition, as, as Rich was discussing. Um, what has changed is the criteria was formerly the same as the management objective. So the management objective for B2 was high quality aquatic habitat, and the criteria was high quality aquatic habitat. Um, we've added three new criteria and defined them uh, to better encompass how we manage aquatic habitat. And just want to take uh, a step back to think about aquatic habitat uh, as it relates to water quality, um, and that kind of sets the table for our changes. So aquatic habitat is really the interaction of a lot of different parameters and variables, uh, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, and temperature, so water quality, water chemistry related variables, uh, substrate and cover, physical in-stream forms that, that affect habitat, and components of hydraulics, water depth, water velocity, um, and larger uh, parameters that extend beyond the stream reach, so connectivity and flow regime, and how these parameters all interact uh, in a given reach is really what creates habitat quality. Um, so any one of these parameters could be so out of the range of natural condition that habitat isn't supported but there's a large range of parameters of these parameters that would allow habitat to be supported. So that really, th this holistic view of habitat really 
drives the addition of the criteria and um, definitions which we've added to the water quality standards. So, so back on that uh, aquatic habitat use table, we added three new criteria in place of aquatic habitat quality. And these are some diverse, uh, some shorter um, definitions than what's in the water quality standards. Um, but essentially, these things in part uh, all contribute to the quality of aquatic habitat. Um, and some of these are new, and some of these have stayed the same. Low characteristics really speak to the hydraulics at a given site or reach. Um, this is largely the same. This relates back to the existing hydrology criteria and has traditionally been the way that the agency has, has managed uh, or uh, regulated uh, aquatic habitat quality. Um, what's new is the addition of physical habitat structure. So bringing in the cover and substrate that provide spawning material and feeding refuge and temperature refuge for aquatic biota. And also a pretty big change to the water quality standards, but not such a big change to how we manage waters, is the addition of stream processes. So flow characteristics and physical habitat structure really speak to habitat uh, at a specific point or reach. Stream processes really speak to habitat at the reach and watershed scale. Um, and what we mean by stream processes is are really the hydrologic sediment and woody debris regimes that create habitat in, in the stream. And that comes back to um, the stream equilibrium concept. So the stream equilibrium concept is essentially uh, the ability of a stream to balance its inputs and react to its watershed. Um, in our river corridor and floodplain rules, so Acts 110 and 138, uh, that have previously been adopted and also our, our stream alt rules, the rivers program manages to this equilibrium condition, which essentially is the the, the stream is, is allowed to react to its watershed, to move, to create habitat in, in, in some places. So habitat moves around. It's referred to as dynamic equilibrium. Um, this has impacts on water quality um, in terms of the creation of, of new spawning habitat, um, creation of new refuge. It also has important human impacts, um, reduction of, of flood damage, and um, uh, reduction of fluvial erosion hazards. So as we come back to what habitat looks like in a stream, what we did with the habitat criteria was try to pull in um, these different components into the water quality standards. So water velocity and depth and flow characteristics, physical habitat and cover and substrate, and stream processes in terms of connectivity, flow regime. And ultimately our goal here was to take something that was high quality aquatic habitat or some degree of quality and really be a lot more specific with what May, what determines habitat quality? Um, it really provide clear guidance um, on how the agency interprets habitat quality. Um, it also allowed us to manage habitat in a holistic way. The way the we've typically managed aquatic habitat has really been through the hydraulics, and where that that does not tell the whole story. Um, the, the, the flow regime and watershed interactions are, are tremendously important to habitat quality and also allowed us to manage habitat at multiple scales. So we've typically looked at habitat in a given reach for a specific project and we're really trying to tie the geomorphology 
the watershed interactions into these criteria. And um, but that that's that was where where we were going, and we think we accomplished it through the addition of the flow characteristics, physical structure, and uh, stream processes criteria. But I think I'll pass that off to you again. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. I couldn't have said it any better. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some of the minor changes that, that we made. Um, we tweaked the um, temperature criteria for cold water fisheries um, in instituting a new class B1. Um, we um, took the existing standard, which um, is, is, was, was applicable to all classes of water, now it's applicable to class B2, which is no, um, no more than a one degree Fahrenheit change. Um, and we gave that to class B1 if the seven day mean of the daily maximum temperatures is under 68 degrees. And this is measured during four, during the four summer months. Um, obviously, one would have to have a continually, continuous monitoring device um, in the water to determine that. Um, for class B1, if that particular uh, statistic, the seven day mean daily max, is over 68 degrees, in other words, it begins to stress uh, cold water species, primarily brook trout, salami sculpin, uh, mongrel sucker in our, in our rivers. Um, we would allow no change in uh, a, uh, a temperature, an instrument temperature from any uh, proposed activity. Um, and for A1, we have no change from background whatsoever. I have an online question. Um, will the physical habitat structure and stream processes metrics be used in determining impairment of the stream and listing on the 303D list? That's your, yeah, with that, that would be a violation of habitat. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the way the, the, the rivers program generally uh, administers these criteria is through the, the regulatory world, so um, in the review of applications. But I believe MAP does have plans, Kathy, to use some of the existing aquatic habitat data to. Uh, Characterize physical structure. Mm -hmm. um, I think also what this criteria allows us to do is to, similar to how the bi biologic metrics has this appendices of uh, criteria, uh, it allows us to come up with metrics to better characterize the physical structure and stream processes. Okay, I think I'm done with it. This, the temperature criteria only um, applies to cold water fisheries. <coughs> okay, the, uh, the new version of the water quality standards included um, a reclassification of several named and unnamed streams within the wilderness areas. Um, this is just a list of those surface waters, um, primarily down uh, south, but also <coughs> in the uh, northern section, the Middlebury. Um, the uh, Glastonbury Wilderness is quite a large um, listing. There's at least six or eight streams down there um, and uh, drainages that um, are included now as uh, Class A1. Ooh, I'm dead here. Oh, there we go. I'm not pressing hard, hard enough. Um, the uh, the biomonitoring section, which I'm a member, um, has been over the last two or three years actively sampling sites that can, can be potentially reclassified to either B1 or A1 for aquatic biota. Um, what we do is we assess the current biological condition during an uh, index period um, during the year, generally between August and October. Um, as a result of this, we have 30 rivers and streams now that are eligible for reclassification over and above those streams that I just listed for uh, from the Green Mountain National Forest. Um, some of them are uh, may be listed as or classified as A1 and some will be one. 
and we will continue to build this list. Okay. Um, yeah, Eric just mentioned that we um, now are listing the uh, biological assessment procedures um, in the water quality standards. This is, is a kind of a baked down version of our procedure, which we, which we call a pink book. It's about, I don't know, 200 pages long or so. Um, we have condensed it into an appendix and it outlines um, how we collect our samples and how we assess them and what metrics we use. Um, we also have, um, we have, we'll be presenting or have presented um, a set of, of macro and rubric criteria for soft bottom streams, which is very unusual. Uh, it may be the first in the country. Um, it's been a bugaboo for benthic biologists for a long time because macroinvertebrates uh, communities within these soft bottom slow winders, as we call them, um, act differently than hard bottom streams. So um, the, uh, the initiation, the introduction of this is is a is a really big boon for us. Okay, this this might be an important slide for some folks um, in the regulatory community. I didn't do that. There we go. Stay. Um, regulatory implications of Class A1. Well, what happens when you classify a water A1? It doesn't mean you can't build in the drainage, but there are some restrictions. Um, and I've listed about seven here, um, eight um, types of activities. Uh, silvicultural and agricultural, if you meet the accepted or required practices, um, that govern these sets of activities. Uh, the assumption that you meet the class, uh, class criteria is also met. Um, the AMPs, the accepted management practices, have been beefed up for um, uh, within the last year. The required agricultural practices are currently being worked on, but they're more stringent than uh, the past practices have been. For Act 250, um, simply means that the buffer protection for waters increases from 50 to 100 percent if the water involved is classified as A1. Direct discharges, no discharge of polluting wastes, uh, which pretty much um, eliminates all wastes, all discharges. Um, indirect discharges, this is one that most people are familiar with. with. Um, a thousand gallons per day uh, in ground uh, and only one of these systems per lot, um, no more. With stormwater permits, an A1 classification contributes to the risk factors involved in writing a permit. Um, this basically uh, means that the best professional or the, um, the best available technology is used. More. Uh, uh, techniques and um, stormwater controls are used to protect the waters in an A1 drainage. Wetlands permits, um, A1 also is involved in the determination of the significance of, the significance of a wetland function. Um, in stream all permits, um, as Eric just pointed out, uh, permits now are based with the, uh, with the idea of stream equilibrium. Um, as a long-term goal. So, so Richard, before you go off that slide, can I ask a question? Jeff. Um, I'm just trying to understand the difference between why indirects are allowed versus the uh, directs are, are essentially not going to be uh, allowed. Yeah, well, direct is, is, as you know, it goes right into that. Right? It, it just goes in there. Um, indirect discharge is filter. They filter the soil. There's a, there's a residence time. Uh, I'm not familiar with the IDRs, the indirect discharge rules, but I assume, maybe Steve can help me, but assume there's a distance involved with the installation of the system in terms of its uh, location. Well, it has pretty specific phosphorus and nitrogen criteria that would have to be met before it meets, you know, meets the receiving water, <clears throat> which are extremely low, and there is sort of a biological standard based on that developed um, called no significant alteration with black oil, sort of an in-stream standard, additional standard. And that really gets to the heart of my question is because with an indirect, 
my understanding is there's the assumption that wastewater reaches the stream. That's the whole basis of the permit. You have to assume that eventually, yes. Yeah. Right. So in one case you're saying probably no, in the other case you're saying up to a thousand gallons a day. And I was just trying to understand that. I'm mm -hmm. not really questioning it, I'm just trying to get a, a sense right. of it. Well, it eventually makes it to the stream, yeah. and the permit process accounts yeah. for that, you know, additional treatment the soils would have to project what the yeah. in-stream concentrations would be of phosphorus and nitrogen, pretty much. Just so everybody knows I'm associated with wastewater, that's why I have yeah. this question. <laughs> would it be possible if there were some sort of a ultra-low, and don't, ex don't expect me to exactly define that, but mm -hmm. some sort of a very advanced ultra-low direct discharge, would there be potential for that, or is it pretty much no? If you follow the language in the water quality standards, no. Okay. It's just very specific. There's no mixing zones allowed, no okay. water management. That just kills it right there. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. 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 Okay. All right, good, thanks. Mm -hmm. So the, just another thing, as Steve pointed out, we do um, hold the aquatic biota, uh, the amount of allowable changes, to much less than even A1 standards. It's very, very restrictive um, when we evaluate an indirect discharge. Yeah. The indirect discharge, is there additional monitoring required? Would you know, Steve? It depends on the size of it, I guess. Okay. But yeah, there is. Yeah. And One of my very guess, large yeah. ones, there is in stream monitoring yeah. to make sure that yeah. most of them definitely have a lot of groundwater okay. monitoring going on. And let me ask, if you don't mind, one other question is the indirect is through the indirect discharge program, which my understanding is they permit 6,500 gallons per day and above. So is the indirect that's being discussed here, is this actually the wastewater through the regional office program? Because yeah. if it's up to 1,000 gallons per day, that, I don't think that could be an indirect discharge because they only kick in at 6,500. Does that make sense? For B1 waters there. B1 or B, B2, yeah. But my, I guess my point was is the indirect discharge permit doesn't permit below 6,500 gallons per day. Right. They, their permits only can oh, be yeah. 6,500 gallons per day or above. If you're below that, you go through the regional office program, i.e. the wastewater rules, mm -hmm. which are much less stringent than the indirect discharge permit requirements. I mean, those are basically for homeowners, that type of thing, and I don't believe there are any monitoring requirements. No. Hopefully the homeowner keeps the system in, <laughs> right, cleans out the septic tank, that type of thing. Those are good questions. I yeah. think we ought to explore that a little bit. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, those are good uh, questions. Great question, up. yeah. Good. Good, because I'm wrapping up. This is pretty much my last slide here. Um, this is uh, Shady Rill as it comes into uh, Wrightsville Reservoir. Um, I'm basically, this is, I'm just going to summarize, um, summarize the improvements that uh, we think we've made with this latest version. Um, we have vastly increased the opportunities to protect more waters within the state at a higher level of protection, um, given that we now have Class B1 and we can now independently um, classify uses. Um, we have um, another example of this is we've widened the ability of our biological assessments. We've extended the number of stream types that we can assess with our quantitative criteria. Um, we, as I mentioned, we went through the water quality standards page by page and clarified a lot of statements. It was really, it was really a lot of fun uh, because a lot of the statements that were made uh, were probably, probably 30 years old. And they simply hadn't been updated and um, <coughs> um, convey the message a little more clearly. Uh, we have more specific criteria included in this, especially as it um, refers to uh, hydrology and our habitat criteria. Um, we spent a long time on the definitions, uh, two or three pages of definitions. Uh, the uh, staff work group, I think we spent at least two hours on one definition alone, reference and natural condition. Um, that was a, a lot of fun. Um, toxicity standards, we updated uh, Appendix C. Um, uh, added an additional dozen or so to keep pace with EGA. Uh, we tweaked some of the language in the anti-degradation section. Um, as an aside, 
the anti-degradation policy for the agency is currently being revised. Uh, but it wasn't in time for the issuance of the water quality standards. And that's it. That's all I have. I welcome questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is James Maroney. Uh, this is my first visit here to a meeting uh, of all you people here. It's very heartening to know that we have such good people on the job here. Uh, my own uh, interest is uh, agriculture and water quality in Vermont. And um, I couldn't help notice, I mean, you only mentioned it twice in your talk, once uh, when you talked about irrigation and other uses. And, and then again, you mentioned a presumption of compliance was something to that. Yeah, so, something to that. Agriculture so in, in, in 1993, the legislature, in its infinite wisdom, uh, passed a memorandum of understanding and took uh, responsibility for water quality away from an A&R and &R gave it to agriculture. Uh, are the ag rules simply no longer the, provenant, the, the province of A&R DEC? The required sense a gap. Yeah, there's the, a gap. The RAPs are being developed within agriculture, um, and we have <laughs> we have. Um, and I'm not. Oh, I know, I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what the extent ANR plays in, a, in the, the, <coughs> the standards, but they are more more strict, the, the on the ground standards. And, we, and it doesn't mean that we won't monitor the waters below a suspected imp, impairment, um, because if we do find an impairment in stream, then we can go back to ag and and say, okay, we have a problem here, and we've done this several times. Yes. So, so we have a backup. Plan. Yeah, I, I just I just put some numbers on the on the board up there uh, earlier before the meeting. The, these are this is a sort of a, a quick summation of a study done by Eric Smeltzer mm -hmm. um, a number of years ago, three or four five years ago. He basically was talking about the, the TMDL. The, the lake can absorb about 500 metric tons of of nutrients, uh, but it's presently taking about 817. Uh, which is to say 317 too much or 35 percent and 200 of those or 65 percent are attributable to agriculture um, and so 65 times 35 is 24 so agriculture in order to meet its requirements right now for clean water would have to reduce its contribution by 24 percent 24 percent the required agricultural practices rules, and I have read them, believe me, I have read them, mm -hmm. impose virtually no meaningful constraints on the conventional dairy industry. The new RAPs are incapable of meeting their target by design, not by accident, but by design. And I came to this meeting today hoping to impress upon you people, all of whom are doing terrific work to pay a lot more attention to what the Ag Department is doing about agriculture's contribution to water quality because it makes your work null. Agriculture is responsible for almost 50% of the problem in Lake Champlain. And after Act 64 is implemented, that circumstance will not change. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, we still, as I said, uh, we sample, <clears throat> we being the biological, the biomonitoring section sample all over the state, and we are certainly aware of conditions in some of the streams that uh, result from agricultural activity. Yeah. And we, we often target them and make make assessments of the biological community. We, we while we do take um, total phosphorus chemistry, water chemistry, while we're there, that's basically where we end. So in terms of addressing your issue, <clears throat> I'm kind of at a lower level <laughs> than that. That's beyond beyond what, what I'm familiar with. But I, 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 feel I understand. I'm, I'm, I'm at the lowest level. I mean, I'm a mere citizen. 
But, but I would say from my study of the situation that the principal reason why Vermont continues to struggle to meet its water quality standards, the single most important reason is the MOU in 1993. And if I were working in this department, I would begin to agitate those at higher levels to get responsibility for water quality back in this department where it belongs. Because agriculture has a different agenda, and it is not clean water. Can I, there are a couple more questions online. Yeah. Um, if I could take those before my, we wrap up. Thank point. you, James. Thank you, James. Real quickly, though, I mean, you're talking about Lake Champlain water quality violation of phosphorus. Well, uh, all the not streams statewide. It's a it's a lake it's a pretty big violation, one. and that's yep. definitely true. We have a water quality violation. Yep. That's why we have a TMDL for Lake yep. Champlain. Big. And and to implement that, I think we're developing a lot of modeling and targeting specific places. Ag is part of it. It's a big part of it. And I think if we need to, we're going to have to go up above what's outlined in that. And I think that's what we're pursuing to do yep. to meet that Lake Champlain. I, I, would be, I would be more skeptical than you have thought to be thus far. Well, we haven't been able to do it for a long time. And yeah, it's going to take 25 a long years. time for a lake to recover, too, once it's done. But I think yeah. we're on a, a good road in that we're throwing some money at it and we're trying to identify, you know, high impact areas, so to speak, high areas of phosphorus yeah. contribution. Yeah. So, yeah. There's two quick two questions I want to have a chance to get to because um, it is almost noon. Um, Pam asks, can you talk more about how the anti-degradation policy will work? Are you? I can't really speak to that now. We're as I mentioned, we were in the uh, we are in the process of developing a new a new policy. Um, what I can say is that the establishment of a intermediate class of waters, class B one. Uh, definitely helps us be able to identify um, a floor within the Class B range of conditions. Uh, the, the whole idea of anti-degradation in the first place tried to ad address that large drop from the top of Class B down to the bottom of Class B. And we have partially addressed that by establishing an intermediate class of waters in this particular version. Second question on table two combined nutrient criteria. The total phosphorus concentrations for class B1 waters are separated between high and medium gradient waters. Mm -hmm. Are there specific slope values to refer to determine whether something is high versus medium gradient? Or is this something more subjective? Um, these, the, uh, <laughs> the nutrient concentration criteria that you see here are part of the aquatic biota um, criteria. Um, they are. They were basically calibrated using macroinvertebrate populations in response to the population to various levels of in-stream phosphorus. And uh, these three um, community types or stream types are basically represent reference condition types. These are natural types of macroinvertebrate communities. Uh, small high gradient. Um, basically represents uh, small cold water streams. Medium high gradient is cold water or warm water, right, Steve? Medium, just the larger streams. And then we go into the warm water medium gradient, which are lower elevation, primarily Champlain drainage. Um, so we have different um, levels. But these, these particular uh, types are based on the macro and rubric, uh, communities, which we use to calibrate uh, these various levels of phosphorus. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I have one more question, if I may. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So, in the beginning of your of your talk, you, you referred to um, under agriculture, irrigation and other uses. Uh, does other uses include passive anti degradation by agriculture? Passive. In other words, irrigation is an active use. You, mm -hmm. you take the water and you spray it on your tomatoes. Yeah, uh, 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 I'm referring to passive anti-degradation as an indirect discharge of, in other words, a, um, 
under the Clean Water Act pollution that happens. That emanates from an agricultural activity? Correct. And somehow miraculously reaches the lake. Yeah, that would be covered under the RAPs. It would be. Yeah, I believe it would. It's on land. Okay, so if in fact that is happening, which clearly it is, I mean, so the Ag Department has been managing the water quality for 25 years or so, and we've seen nothing but increases. How does your department react to that failure? Well, I'm not the person to really ask on that. I know that we have been working with agriculture. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, honestly. Yeah, but we have been working with agriculture to more align the RAPs with our vision of what the impact is. Steve mentioned the modeling. What my section does more is assess the biological communities right downstream of, say, like an effluent that's running off a particular field. And we're characterizing the biological health in that stream, which has not a lot of implications on what's going to happen way downstream in the lake. So we may have a condition that meets our aquatic biota criteria downstream of a particular field, while at the same time that field is contributing too much phosphorus. So there is a disconnect there. The good thing is that we are there and we're looking at it and we are taking measurements. And if the phosphorus or anything else, nitrates, running off this field is excessive, we can identify it and enact controls, get the process going with agriculture to correct the situation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. One last question online and then we should wrap up. Is there a timeline for additional streams to be typed or classified from B2 or 3 to B1? We are anticipating that this year we will be presenting a set of streams for reclassification. It will happen this year and probably on an annual basis. In order to reclassify streams, we have to go through a public process. We also have to go into the water quality standards and revise the water quality standards. So it will happen on an annual basis. We've got a meeting on Monday actually to start the process of, okay, now we have the data. This data qualifies for reclassification. How do we go about the designation or the classification of a particular stream? How much of the stream is going to be classified? How far upstream? How far downstream? So forth and so on. So, yes, we are actively involved in that and hope to get the ball rolling pretty soon. Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Otherwise, we'll take a brief recess and then we'll come back for our last case. Thank you.